Welcome to the award-winning Consumer Finance Monitor podcast, where we explore important new developments in the world of consumer financial services and what they mean for your business, your customers, and the industry. This is a weekly show brought to you by the Consumer Financial Services Group at the Ballard Spire Law Firm. I'm your host, Alan Kaplinski, the former practice group leader for 25 years and now senior counsel of the Consumer Financial Services Group at Ballard Spar. And I'm very pleased to be moderating today's program. For those of you who want even more information, don't forget to go to our blog, consumerfinancemonitor.com, the same name as our podcast show. We've hosted the blog since 2011. We actually launched it on the very same day that the CFPB became operational, July 21, 2011. There is a tremendous amount of relevant industry content on our blog. We also regularly host webinars on subjects of interest to those in the industry. Uh, If you want to subscribe to our blog or to be on the mailing list, to receive invites for our many webinars, please visit us at BallardSpar.com. And if you like our podcast show today, please let us know about it. Please leave us a review on whatever platform you use to obtain your podcasts, be it Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or uh, wherever. Also, please let us know If you have any ideas for other topics that we should consider covering or speakers that we should consider as guests on our show. So turning to our program today, I'm very pleased and excited to be joined by somebody who's been a friend of mine for well over a decade, uh, and that is uh, Professor Art Wilmarth, Arthur Wilmarth. Uh, who is Professor Emeritus at George Washington University School of Law. Uh, He was a member of the faculty at at GW Law School from 1986 to 2020. He joined GW Law School's faculty after spending 11 years in private law practice, uh, including as a partner in Jones Day's Washington D.C. office. He served as executive director of the law school's Center for Law, Economics, and Finance from 2011 to 2014. He is the author of Taming the Megabanks, Why We Need a New Glass-Steagall Act, which was published by Oxford Press in 2020, and co-editor of The Panic of 2008, The Causes, Consequences, and Implications for Reform, published by Edward Elgar in 2010. He's published more than 40 law review articles and book chapters in the fields, a field of financial regulation and American constitutional history. In 2005, the American College of Consumer Financial Services Lawyers awarded him its prize for the best law review article published in the field of consumer financial services law during the previous year. Uh, He has testified on financial regulatory issues before committees of the U.S. Congress and the California legislature. 2010, he was a consultant to the Financial Crisis Inquiry Commission, the body that got established by Congress to report on the causes of the financial crisis of 2007 to 09. Uh, He's also a member of the International Advisory Board for the Journal of Banking Regulation. And uh, one other thing that, not not on his bio, but how I got to uh, know uh, Art Wilmarth was for the work he did as outside counsel to the Conference of State Bank Supervisors, CSBS. And uh, very often in my practice, uh, I had issues that involved the conference and 
uh, art uh, would be brought into the discussion by his client. Uh, what we're going to be talking about today is um, a very recently written law review article uh, that will very soon be published by the Washington University Law Review. And the title of the article is, We Must Protect Investors and Our Banking System from the Crypto Industry. And one would never know, after reading this article, that Art had retired from teaching at the law school because it is a uh, I would say a magnum opus it is a, it's a lengthy law review article, but with a tremendous amount of thought leadership being given to this very knotty problem uh, that seems to go on and on as to how we should be regulating crypto. Uh, but no doubt we're already well behind the eight ball, but that's usually the case. Uh, when Congress tries to catch up with any kind of major technological development. So um, before uh, we, we talk about your article, uh, Art, it's really great to connect with you again. And congratulations on this article, which uh, I think is uh, uh, really going to um, sharpen the focus on uh, what we ought to be doing with respect to crypto. Well, many thanks, Alan. It's, it's a great pleasure to be with you and, and with your audience. And I certainly am very grateful to you for uh, your interest in my article and giving me a, a chance to talk about it. As a note to our listeners, my interview with Professor Wilmarth was recorded shortly before July 31. On July 31, after we recorded the podcast with Professor Wilmarth, and a very important new opinion was issued by Judge Rakoff of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York on the question of whether cryptocurrencies should be treated as securities under the Securities Act of 1933 and the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. In a case called SEC, Securities Exchange Commission, versus Terraform, that's T-E-R-R-A-F-O-R-M, Judge Rakoff denied Terraform's motion to dismiss the SEC's complaint. The SEC alleged that Terraform issued five cryptocurrencies, the Terra USD stablecoin, the Luna digital token, and three other digital tokens that were securities under the 1933 and the 1934 Acts. Judge Rakoff determined that all five cryptocurrencies were securities, whether they were purchased by institutional investors directly from Terraform or by retail investors in transactions with third parties. Judge Rakoff strongly disagreed with Judge Torres's distinction in the Ripple case between institutional and retail investors. And you will note later in my interview with Professor Wilmarth, uh, the professor gets into a lot of detail about the Ripple case. Judge Rakoff placed great emphasis on Terraform's public statements that the value of its tokens would increase as Terraform's ecosystem grew, and that Terraform would reinvest profits from sales of its tokens in order to expand its ecosystem and make it more valuable. Judge Rakoff concluded that Terraform's public representations caused both institutional and retail investors to expect that the value of their tokens would increase based on Terraform's efforts to expand its ecosystem. I would note also for our listeners that this week uh, we published on our blog, Consumer Finance Monitor, a discussion of the uh, Judge uh, Rakoff's opinion in the Terraform case. And we also pointed out something that I didn't get into with my interview with Professor Wilmarth, 
that to the extent that the Judge Rakoff is correct, that um, uh, that these cryptocurrencies constitute securities, then that uh, should eliminate the issue of whether or not you need to be licensed as a money transmitter under state money transmitter laws. Uh, and uh, Lisa Lanham in our group that is involved in the licensing practice has made that point that this difference of opinion in the Ripple case and now the Terraform case of two judges, both in the Southern District of New York, has also thrown this licensing, state licensing issue into somewhat of a cocked hat. My words, not the words of Lisa Lanham. So the only other thing that I want to mention about this before we launch into my interview is that last week, Coinbase, which is a crypto exchange, filed a motion in the Southern District of New York to dismiss the SEC's enforcement action against Coinbase. The district court in the Coinbase case will have to address the conflict now that exists between the Ripple and the Terraform decisions. Before uh, we launch into a number of topics I want to discuss with you, uh, even though the paper hasn't yet been published by the Washington University Law Review, it can be downloaded free of charge from the Social Science Research Network. And uh, if you uh, go on that network and you do a search under Arthur Wilmarth, uh, I assume that your article will pop up and then it can be downloaded. Yes. All right. So uh, in your article, uh, Art, you make a distinction between, uh, in talking about crypto, uh, about the two major types of cryptocurrencies, uh, the so-called fluctuating value cryptocurrencies and stable coins. Can you explain to our listeners what they are and how they differ from one another? Yes. So fluctuating value cryptocurrencies, they have no fixed value and their so-called market value or traded value uh, moves back and forth uh, in in conjunction with general market movements. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two largest and most dominant uh, fluctuating value cryptocurrencies. And then uh, in contrast, stable coins, they are instruments that represent and purport uh, to maintain a stable value uh, against a selected fiat currency, which in almost all cases is the U.S. dollar. There are a few, uh, there are a small number of of stable coins that are linked to other fiat currencies like the euro, uh, but they're really very tiny in comparison. And do they trade also? Stable coins? Yes, uh, they, they do. So you you can go to uh, a cryptocurrency exchange or platform uh, and buy stable coins. The two biggest uh, are Tether, which is a somewhat mysterious, murky instrument because uh, it's an offshore stable coin, not effectively linked. Uh, to the U.S. jurisdiction, although U.S. residents uh, do buy it uh, and sell it. Uh, and the other one, which is which is better known, is the USD stablecoin, uh, which is issued by a consortium uh, created by Circle and Coinbase. Tether and, and, and um, USD coin represent that they'll maintain parity with the U.S. dollar, uh, and they account for about 80% or so of the total stablecoin market. I take it um, for stablecoins is the currency, um, I forgot the expression you used, but it's tied to, most of them tied to the U.S. dollar. Does that mean that there are dollars that secure the stablecoin so that in the event the stablecoin uh, loses value, uh, you could look behind that to the security of the U.S. dollar? So the, the most common stable coins claim or purport to have reserves. The, the reserves for Tether are, again, somewhat shrouded in mystery. 
they claim that they have a certain amount of U.S. treasuries uh, or government uh, guaranteed uh, U.S. securities, a certain number of bank deposits. Uh, but they also in the past have had a lot of commercial paper, including commercial paper from some Chinese companies. Circle represent and claim that uh, they, they hold um, reserves consisting of either uh, 90-day treasury bills or, or shorter uh, or seven-day repurchase agreements uh, collateralized by not longer than 90-day treasury bills or uh, bank deposits. They issue what are called attestation reports uh, from a, a U.S. auditing firm. They're not for, they're not formally audited, uh, but the, the attestation report claims or states that uh, Circle holds the reserves that they say that it holds. The USD coin is somewhat akin to a money market fund. Um, and to my mind, it has all of the shortcomings and vulnerabilities of a money market fund because if investors ever think that its reserves are not adequate, investors are very likely to run. I mean, we, we've we experienced uh, two systemic runs on money market funds, particularly the prime money market funds that aren't backed completely by government securities or government guaranteed securities. We, we had two runs in, in 2008 and 2020, which required essentially a complete rescue and bailout by the U.S. government. And my concern with stable coins even ones like the USD stablecoin, which is supposed to be the cleanest and safest, is that they're subject to exactly the same vulnerabilities and runs uh, if people have any doubt about the, the adequacy of their reserves. Yeah, I'd like to move on because I want to, I have a lot that I want to cover with you. Um, so what are the primary uses and uh, the um, risks of both fluctuating value crypto and stable coin. Fluctuating value cryptocurrencies haven't shown legitimate or lawful economic use except for speculation. Uh, and you can speculate in fluctuating value cr- cryptocurrencies by obviously buying and selling, by lending them, uh, essentially pr- providing them to someone else with uh, an agreed upon uh, return, or, or so called staking in some cases. So uh, you know, Bitcoin basically uh, has a proof model where transactions are, are verified uh, by miners, essentially, who solve very complex problems. Uh, and when they verify a transaction, it's added as a, a new block on the chain. Ethereum is different because it, it wanted to respond to the growing controversies about the uh, enormous amounts of energy being consumed by Bitcoin miners. Ethereum moved to a, a, a essentially a proof of stake uh, system where essentially if enough people owning enough uh, Ethereum coins or Ether coins uh, agree on, uh, you know, verifying a transaction, their combined stakes will, will uh, be sufficient to verify that transaction. Investors can lend out their, their, their coins uh, for staking purposes and receive staking fees from the groups that uh, that perform these staking services. Uh, with the fluctuating value of cryptocurrencies, you're either going to make money by buying and selling uh, for speculative purposes or by lending them out uh, for loan transactions or these staking transactions and getting a return from that. Yeah, well, I guess uh, since it's supposed to be a currency, uh, in some places... Not too many in the United States, I don't think. It, it'll get accepted the same way the U.S. dollar would be accepted to pay for goods or services. Places like El Salvador have experimented with the use of Bitcoin as a currency. Uh, my my understanding is that hasn't gone very far because uh, the, the value of Bitcoin you know collapsed between November twenty. 20- 21 and the end of 2022 by about 70 percent, and even though it's it's somewhat rallied um, uh, this year a little bit, it's still 60 percent below its peak uh, in November 2021. Ethereum or Ether followed exactly the same pattern, uh, you know, running up 
a lot in, uh, until November 2021 and then collapsing by 70 percent uh, by the end of 2022. And today it's it's still about 60 percent below its peak. There's been a really limited take up uh, of, by, of Bitcoin as a currency, even in El Salvador, which obviously has had a very volatile currency. So that uh, the, the volatility of these uh, fluctuating value of cryptocurrencies has really not made them effective or reliable as a payment instrument. A lot of the uses we've seen have been for criminal purposes. Both markets are shrouded in a lot of secrecy, and often uh, the transactions are done by anonymous wallets that uh, can't be traced uh, very easily. Many criminals are obviously using particularly Bitcoin for you know, money laundering transactions, uh, for uh, extorting people from ransomware attacks or other things, you know, evading terrorist sanctions. We know that Russia, for example, has used uh, Bitcoin to evade uh, uh, sanctions so that uh, uh, the amount of criminal use of these uh, cryptocurrencies, I think, is very alarming. These markets are, are effectively not regulated in any in any systematic or effective way. They're largely non-transparent and opaque. And actually, that's that was sort of part of the, you know, the, the the marketing case for them. You know, if you don't if you don't want your trans transactions to be transparent, if you don't want Big Brother watching what you're doing, you know, come come to crypto land. But that rapidly degenerates into criminal uh, misuse of these currencies and transactions. What about um, stablecoin uses? Uh, is that different? So stablecoins are linked somewhat. To the problem of opacity and non-transparency, because stablecoins really came about uh, as a way of allowing investors and traders in the fluctuating value of cryptocurrencies to uh, exchange their fiat currency. In other words, if you had a bunch of dollars, uh, you would exchange your 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 fiat dollars into stablecoins, and then you would use the stablecoins either to uh, trade in the fluctuating value of cryptocurrencies or to uh, they, they could be used as collateral for lending transactions. Uh, why were people uh, flipping their 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 dollars uh, into stable coins? Uh, now, some people said, well, it was an easier way to go from Bitcoin to Ethereum. And if you wanted to go from uh, one exchange or platform to another, that supposedly stable coins were an easier way to do that than uh, using dollars. I I frankly don't understand that uh, explanation because it seems to me that the, the U.S. dollar is the most fungible and reliable currency in the world. And I can't imagine that stable coins are, are considered more reliable or fungible than the dollar. My suspicion is that it's harder for the authorities to trace uh, transactions conducted by stable coins than it would be if you conducted the equivalent transactions with the equivalent amount of U.S. dollars. Because once you start using large amounts of U.S. dollars, money laundering laws, Bank Secrecy Act uh, regulations, FinCEN regulations that are going to attach to that use of U.S. dollars. But if you convert it into stable coins and then dump the stable coins into a into an anonymous uh, digital wallet, it may be much harder. Uh, for people like FinCEN to follow what you're doing. So my suspicion is that stablecoins initially uh, were developed as a way of evading uh, scrutiny and, and, and evading enforcement. Now, uh, to be fair, uh, the stablecoin advocates say we're also developing stablecoins really as, as, as a form of um, private digital dollars, and they could be used to accelerate and, and uh, make more efficient uh, various kinds of payment transactions. And um, I think that that is potentially true, although to me it's disturbing because these would be private digital dollars that at the moment uh, are not regulated in any meaningful way and, and certainly are not subject to the kinds of uh, uh, regulations that apply to bank deposits. So they're, they would be essentially substitutes for bank deposits, but would purport to have the same reliability as bank deposits, could be used for payment transactions uh, of various types, both within and across borders, uh, but wouldn't have the same 
uh, oversight and regulation. So uh, I don't see how uh, payment stable coins could coexist with, uh, let's say, digitized bank deposits, uh, digital representations of bank deposits without causing a lot of confusion and potentially undermining uh, the effectiveness of banking regulation and indeed monetary policy. Uh, they essentially would become a form of shadow deposits. And the argument I developed in my book, uh, T- Taming the Mega Banks, was that we should say that nobody except for regulated and FDIC insured banks could issue deposits. Uh, and and that, would in, that would include basically saying no more money market funds. Uh, they would have to go into the banking system. And so if we did away with these shadow deposits and put them back into the banking system, we would greatly increase the effectiveness of monetary policy as well as financial regulation generally. But if you allow stable coins to exist, uh, they're essentially a new form of shadow deposits, and uh, they're not even regulated as well as money market funds. So that this would compound the problem we have with shadow deposits and shadow banking existing outside the banking system with inadequate uh, controls from either the monetary policy or financial regulation side. Right, right. So you mentioned... A little bit earlier, uh, there was a, a, a crypto boom in 2020, 21, I guess, during the pandemic, the heart of the pandemic. Uh, and then there was a crash in 2022. Of what, what were the main factors that led to the boom? Uh, and then what, what led to the crash? The crypto boom was part of what, what has become known as the everything rally. Uh, the federal government authorized uh, more than $5 trillion of fiscal stimulus in response to the pandemic, which was more than four times as large as the amount of stimulus that was authorized in response to the global financial crisis of 2007 and through nine. And and then you had the the Fed essentially reauthorizing all of the um, monetary uh, expansion policies that they had used in, in 2008 and nine, and adding some um, so that you not, not only had essentially a complete guarantee of the wholesale financial markets, things like uh, uh, securities repurchase agreements uh, and commercial paper and money market funds, uh, but you had it expanded to include the entire corporate bond market and uh, ultimately even so-called fallen angels that had become junk bonds. And the Fed's balance sheet uh, more than doubled uh, between the beginning of 2020 and, and, and the end of 2021. The broader M2 monetary supply showed a, a similar dramatic increase. Predictably, you, you had a, a tremendous increase in demand for investments of all types, at the same time, the, the, the Fed had reduced uh, prevailing interest rates to zero. So so-called safe investments like government treasury bills uh, of any um, reasonable duration, uh, bank savings accounts, I mean, we're paying you know very little. Uh, and the only way to make money uh, was to invest in risky things. So you see a tremendous uprush in demand uh, for you know, high technology stocks, uh, for leveraged uh, high risk loans, uh, junk bonds, commercial real estate, residential real estate, and crypto. Crypto came along at this time and said, "We're the most high yielding investment out there," and that was true. Uh, the, the the total market cap mar- capitalization of all cryptocurrencies. Uh, essentially increased from 200 billion uh, at the beginning of, of 2020 to uh, almost three trillion by November 2021. So that's like a 1,500 percent increase. And uh, th- I think there was the FOMO rally, the fear, the fear of missing out rally. People just thought, I've, I've got to get into this. Uh, you know, I, I see my friends and neighbors buying this stuff, and they they seem to be coming wealthy overnight, I have to get into it. And uh, so that worked until 
finally, right, inflation began to rise. Uh, inflation began to take off. By November 2021, it was clear that you know the, the, the money supply was not going to keep expanding. The government stimulus payments had basically run their course, uh, and the Fed was going to start raising interest rates in 2022. The NASDAQ and other uh, higher risk uh, investments, um, a peak is reached you know, in November 2021 and then begins to decelerate. And then as crypto decelerated and interest rates rose during 2022, a number of these platforms that had grown very rapidly uh, begin coming unstuck and uh, you know, scandals are exposed, all, all sorts of misconduct. As I argued in my, my, my article, it was reminiscent of the, the fraud that went on in the 1920s, you know, in the U.S. stock market, the, the roaring 20s, when stock trading was unregulated. Uh, and uh, it, it had hallmarks of the dot-com telecom boom. Uh, and it looked like, in some ways, like the subprime mortgage boom. These were all Ponzi schemes of different types. And I think, to me, the crypto boom and crash resembled classic Ponzi scheme. Let's turn to uh, on the banking industry. I'm particularly interested uh, about, uh, were banks getting involved to some extent in the crypto business? Uh, to, and what were they doing? They, they weren't accepting crypto deposits, I take it. You still, if you wanted to make a deposit, had to be U.S. dollars. Uh, what, what, what types of things were the banks doing? And uh, were they being encouraged or discouraged by the uh, regulators, both at the federal and the state level. Uh, yes, this this was another area that was frankly a surprise to me as I got into it. So you know, I had seen evidence that uh, some banks were getting into this business, but the regulators kept saying it was so limited and so narrow and nothing to worry about. And but I, as I began to look at it, I said, uh, this doesn't look very limited to me. Uh, Wyoming. Uh, in, in 2020, you know, passed this law where they would create what they call special purpose uh, depository institutions, which were essentially crypto banks, which actually could take crypto deposits and could provide custody services and, and other payment services uh, to crypto providers. And they would not be required to have uh, federal deposit insurance. They would be required to have uh, reserves for the crypto assets that they accepted as deposits. Uh, and uh, what those reserves would look like uh, was somewhat left up to the discretion of the Wyoming regulator. Uh, they were supposed to be, quote, you know, reasonably safe. Um, I wasn't very reassured by the restrictions put on assets. They issued four charters. Two that were better known were Custodia uh, and, and Kraken, and uh, they um, they did begin you know providing custody services. I don't think Custodia and, and Kraken had yet have yet gotten to the point of actually issuing uh, stable coins. New York chartered nine essentially special purpose non depository uh, trust charters. They they weren't allowed to take deposits, but they were allowed to provide custodial and fiduciary services. Uh, and one of them, called Paxos, was allowed to issue uh, stable coins uh, at, at first on behalf of Binance, uh, and then uh, also on behalf of its own Paxos affiliate uh, to, to provide, you know, custody services. New York told uh, Paxos in, in February of this year to, to stop issuing the Binance stable coin because uh, Binance, which is the largest crypto exchange in the world essentially is unregulated uh, in the United States. And uh, the, the Commodities Future Trading Commission has recently sued them for essentially doing business in the United States as a uh, commodities derivatives uh, trader uh, without compliance with the Commodities Exchange Act. Um, so you have, the, you have this activity occurring at the state level, and then you, then you start seeing activity at the federal level. Bank of New York Mellon uh, began offering custodial services uh, for uh, cryptocurrencies, including Bitcoin, uh, with the approval uh, of its regulators. 
the OCC and, and the New York Fed. The OCC issued four letters in 2020 and 2021, and, and, and the first three basically allowed uh, national banks to offer custodial services, to offer payment services, and to issue their own stable coins uh, if they were backed by appropriate reserves and were linked only to the U.S. dollar. And in 2021, uh, uh, after the, the Biden administration came in uh, and acting controller Sue uh, took office, uh, they issued a fourth letter essentially saying, well, you, you have to um, consult with us and get uh, advance approval before you do any of these things. And you have to show us that what you're doing is safe and sound. But they didn't withdraw any of the authorities that they had previously given. Signature Bank in, in New York, which was a state non-member bank, uh, and Silvergate, which was a Fed member, uh, California State Bank, developed payment platforms uh, allowing crypto exchanges to uh, essentially uh, bring bring dollars uh, to the bank and uh, exchange dollar payments with their customers uh, and any other customer of the bank on a 24-7, 365 basis. These are payment platforms uh, that were proprietary. And if you were a customer of the bank, you could exchange payments with any other customer of the bank uh, including your, your own customers or other crypto platforms on a continuous basis. The Silvergate, more than 90% of its deposits uh, were crypto-related deposits. Signature, uh, at one point, uh, was up to about 30%. It later went down. Um, they were involved with uh, uh, FTX, both of them. Uh, and were both uh, embroiled in the bankruptcy proceedings uh, affecting uh, FTX. And there there were class action lawsuits filed against both banks alleging that they enabled or allowed FTX to unlawfully commingle uh, customer funds uh, in their deposit accounts with uh, FTX funds or the, the funds of Alameda, which was the affiliated hedge fund of F FTX. And that the bank's either knowingly or negligently allowed funds to be moved around between all these accounts uh, so that customer accounts were not segregated and, and preserved. Two banks were actually offering crypto trading services to their customers. Uh, one was something called Vast Bank out of Oklahoma. It's a national bank. And under Brian Brooks, who was the acting controller, the last acting controller under Donald Trump, they had essentially allowed them to offer this crypto trading service uh, to their bank deposit customers, again, on a continuous basis where they, they could even devote part of their direct deposits to go into crypto investments. Uh, when I last checked the VAST website, it's still operative today. The OCC has not withdrawn uh, that authorization. Another bank, which uh, is owned by uh, Sophie, which I guess used to be called Social Finance, uh, Sophie has a digital trading subsidiary. Uh, Sophie acquired a, a California bank and renamed it Sophie. It became a Fed member bank. And the Fed basically said, well, you know, crypto trading uh, is not authorized uh, for bank holding companies, but you have a transitional period since you just became a bank holding company. You can continue this for two years under the transitional authority. Uh, and you could extend it for three more years, potentially with the Fed's approval. Sophie Bank uh, was offering uh, crypto trading services through its affiliate to its customers. And uh, Senator Sherrod Brown and some of his colleagues on the Senate Banking Committee wrote a letter to Sophie and, and the Fed and said, why, why are you allowing this? This is very dangerous. Um, so th then there was a, a strange bank out in Washington called uh, FBH, which temporarily was called Moonstone Bank, that uh, FTX bought a large equity investment in. And their plan was to use FTX as a platform uh, for doing crypto trading as an authorized banking activity uh, without having to comply with SEC regulations. Well, that, that didn't get off the ground until FTX collapsed. FBH was owned by uh, a guy named Jean Chalopin, uh, who's connected to Deltec Bank, which is the major bank for 
uh, tether down in the Bahamas, and the Fed basically allowed that that change of control transaction uh, allowed uh, then uh, uh, FBH to become a state member bank, and the FTX investment shortly followed that transaction. And I'm thinking, what is the San Francisco Fed thinking or the board? Because now they have Silvergate, which is essentially a crypto uh, payments platform, and this Moonstone Bank, which is trying to become essentially a full service crypto bank. And they're not they're not objecting, and they're allowing Sophie to continue doing. Uh, a digital uh, crypto trading service to bank customers on a transitional basis. And this made me very much concerned that, you know, the, the, the federal regulators were acquiescing and to some extent perhaps silently encouraging these various types of experiments with something that struck me as incredibly risky. Uh, now, after the F- FTX collapse and then shortly after the Genesis uh, 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 trading collapse, uh, the federal regulators changed their tune and they issued a series of guidance letters between January and March of this year in which they said, well, you know, we're very concerned about this and we don't want crypto risks to get into the banking system. And we're going to look very seriously at anything that anybody does related to the crypto space. They, they pretty much said uh, we would be almost certainly opposed to any bank engaging in uh, trading or investing in in, in crypto uh, currencies directly. Uh, they didn't issue any official ban, uh, but clearly the, the the feeling was that they had uh, you know thrown a lot of cold water on this. But it, it's fair to say that the the barrier between banking and crypto is very permeable and not secure. Okay, so uh, we had uh, Silvergate. Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, all of them uh, failed. Uh, and uh, do you believe uh, it was a result of their um, heavy involvement with crypto? Yes, crypto played unquestionably a dominant role in the in the collapse of Silvergate. Uh, I think a significant role in the collapse of Signature, and and uh, certainly had uh, a not insubstantial role uh, in the failure of, of Silicon Valley Bank. So Silvergate was about a $10 billion bank. About 90% of its deposits uh, were crypto related. During the, the crypto crash, and particularly after FTX collapsed, a lot of its crypto related deposits were either were caught up in the, in the FTX bankruptcy uh, or were removed uh, as the crypto crash continued. So they lost about two thirds of their deposits in the last three months of of 2022. They were forced to go to the Federal Home Loan Bank of San Francisco and take out large advances uh, from the Federal Home Loan Bank to make up for the deposits they lost. By the beginning of March, they, they were defunct. So they went into voluntary liquidation They weren't closed by the FDIC, but they went into voluntary liquidation, which is normally something you would not do unless you were pretty sure that you were going to be closed imminently. Um, They claimed that they would be able to cover all their deposits with their remaining assets. Uh, I will be very interested to see if that actually turns out to be the case. Um, But no doubt, uh, the, the, the collapse of Silvergate and its undeniable connection to crypto uh, had a had a big uh, impact on the other two larger banks, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, which was a almost a two hundred billion dollar bank, and Signature, uh, which was uh, slightly over a hundred billion. Silvergate went into voluntary liquidation on the morning that that, that Silicon Valley Bank announced that it would sell off uh, a large portion of its available for sale securities uh, and take almost a two billion dollar loss on that, uh, and disclose that. You know, it was losing uninsured deposits and that uh, it was taking out larger and larger amounts of uh, federal home loan bank advances and discount window loans. So Silvergate's collapse accelerated the panic that was beginning to develop at uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Undoubtedly, uh, Signature Bank had been experiencing the same kind of uh, deposit 
uh, shrinkage and withdrawal that Silvergate had gone through. Now, Signature tried to say that they were doing it deliberately to reduce their exposure to crypto. Uh, perhaps so, but they they lost a lot of their crypto-related deposits uh, in the last three months of 2022. And there was no doubt that as more and more stories uh, came out about Signature's connection to crypto, uh, some of their own uninsured depositors became you know, very concerned. Uh, they had a lot of commercial real estate uh, investors and entrepreneurs among their uh, depositors. About 90% of, un, un, of their deposits were uninsured, uh, not as heavily focused in crypto, but significantly related to crypto. So they were just, they were suffering shrinkage and and uh, loss of deposits and the need to rely more on federal home loan bank advances, discount window loans. When Silicon Valley Bank went down uh, on the on the morning of Friday, March tenth, the the um, run on Signature accelerated, and over the weekend, uh, the, the regulators concluded that Signature couldn't survive either, uh, and so it was closed over the weekend. Crypto was not a big part of the Silicon Valley Bank story as reported, at least not in most places. It wasn't the biggest part of their business, but they had significant exposure to crypto in the sense that they had made many venture uh, venture capital loans to uh, uh, either venture capital firms that supported crypto startups and in some cases the crypto startups themselves. And they also acted as custodian for deposits from crypto firms. In fact, some of the firms that had banked with Silvergate moved their deposits over to Silicon Valley Bank. When Silicon Valley Bank was closed on, on Friday, March 10th, around noon, $3.3 billion of Circle's reserves for the USD stablecoin were being held at SVB. Those deposits were frozen. Uh, the FDIC announced on Friday uh, that they uh, intended to, on Monday, you know, transfer the insured deposits to a bridge bank that they would set up and pay an advance dividend on the uninsured deposits, but otherwise would not cover the uninsured deposits. The uninsured deposits would take some kind of haircut, depending on, on what the estimated results of liquidating uh, uh, the bank would be. That caused a panic among venture capital firms, among technology firms, uh, particularly the, the, the biotechnology startups that Silicon Valley Bank specialized in, and among crypto firms. So when Circle finally uh, disclosed later that day that they had $3.3 billion of their reserves, which was about 10% of their cash reserves tied up at Silicon Valley Bank, uh, in, investors ran on the on the USD stablecoin. It broke the buck and, and fell to about 88 cents. And the DAI stablecoin, which was sort of a hybrid stablecoin that had a lot of uh, non-cash reserves, and they were holding USD stablecoins as part of the reserves, they broke the buck and fell to about 90 cents on the dollar. So, And according to stories published in the Financial Times and a number of crypto journals, um, there was a crisis brewing that many crypto people thought would be worse than the Terra uh, and possibly the FTX crises in terms of melting down the crypto ecosystem. So all these technology, venture capital, crypto people obviously are, are lobbying uh, the Biden administration and Congress and the regulators. You've got to save you know, the uninsured depositors of Silicon Valley Bank. And as we know, they were saved, and the Fed set up a new bank term lending program to, to further help prop up banks. I personally have a strong feeling that the impending meltdown of the crypto ecosystem might have had some impact on that decision to bail out all of Silicon Valley Bank's uninsured depositors. It, so I, I, I can't imagine that it was irrelevant. All the uninsured depositors were protected on Monday the 13th. Uh, USD stablecoin and DAI restore their one dollar pegs, uh, and the crypto crisis is, is averted. And 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 one uh, crypto insider said, "Well, this was like the Cuban miss missile crisis. You know, we almost had a complete Armageddon, but we avoided it." 
This, I think, shows exactly how vulnerable the stablecoin universe is. Uh, it also shows how dangerous it is for this unregulated crypto slash stablecoin universe to, to, to be connected to the banking system in any way. Yeah, well, I wanted uh, in our remaining time, I'd like to turn to what you've recommended. Uh, one of your recommendations is that the SEC should be the primary federal regulator of most fluctuating value cryptocurrencies rather than the Commodities Future Trading Commission or the CFTC. Uh, why is it uh, that uh, uh, you think the SEC is uh, the appropriate regulator here? And, and would it require legislation in order to accomplish that? I agree with uh, SEC Chairman Gensler that uh, with the exception of Bitcoin, most fluctuating value cryptocurrencies would fall into the classification of securities under either the Howey and Company test uh, or the Reeves test. That either if you're essentially buying and selling these uh, cryptocurrencies with the idea that you'll be making money based upon the actions of others. And it's pretty clear that Ethereum is really governed by large groups that come together in these staking pools to, to make decisions that the passive investors are not involved at all. And there is some kind of centralized governance or management, and that's how you make your money. That would fall into the Howey test. Or if you're lending or essentially staking your tokens, which is to me akin to lending, uh, that would match the Reeves test where you're you're lending out and you're expecting a return. Now, Bitcoin probably as currently operating doesn't fit into either of those tests because Bitcoin seems to be a completely decentralized system with no governing group, no governing management. There's no continuing group uh, that really exercises any sort of control over it. And uh, Chairman Gensler has sort of admitted that. But let's say for those that, that do meet the Howey and, and, uh, or Reeves test, which I think were most of them, uh, the SEC has much more comprehensive powers. So, for example, the, the CFTC cannot regulate spot trades in commodities. Uh, the, the CFTC doesn't really have a, a very strong or explicit investor protection mandate or much of a history of investor protection. Again, they, they can't regulate what we would think of as brokers or dealers if the brokers or dealers are only operating in, in spot contracts as opposed to derivatives or futures. Uh, the SEC has essentially comprehensive authority. Once once it's a security, they have comprehensive authority over uh, the trading, the exchange. There's no need for legislation, I take it. Yes, you wouldn't you wouldn't need legislation for any of that. You would simply need recognition that these are securities. Uh, and of course there's litigation ongoing uh, that would suggest that we'll get more clarity about you know, just what cryptocurrencies uh, uh, qualify as securities. Of course, it probably wouldn't hurt for Congress to step up to the plate and confirm that, right? Right. Rather than letting it be done piece by piece through enforcement and litigation, we'd much better if Congress made it clear. And I think that if Congress decides that Bitcoin is really a, a commodity and not a securities, uh, then fine. But then you ought to give the CFTC, you know, spot, you know, uh, regulation authority over spot trades uh, as opposed to only derivatives or futures uh, if, if it's a commodity. The CFTC has also been, I think, more frequently captured by the industry it regulates than the SEC. The SEC's record is certainly not spotless, but it, it has tended to be at least somewhat more independent of the industries it regulates compared to the CFTC. It has more resources, again, more more experience. So I, I, I do think that that uh, based on on the past track record, uh, the SEC is 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 the far safer pair of hands. If you were going to give it to the CFTC, you, you'd have to really greatly increase their resources and and their powers. Of course, I. As I say in the article, I'd be very happy to see the SEC and CFTC merged so we didn't have these jurisdictional conflicts. So, um, Art, 
I want to get your thoughts on uh, very recent enforcement actions against Binance and Coinbase. Well, what, uh, how does that impact uh, uh, the proposal that the SEC should be recognized as the primary regulator of fluctuating value cryptos? I think in some ways the, the, the Binance and Coinbase enforcement actions uh, you know, proceed on grounds that the SEC had, you know, has established in, in some of their previous cases, uh, most recently the LBRY case up in New Hampshire, uh, by saying that uh, they believe that, um, you know, fluctuating value cryptocurrencies uh, are, are security is subject to the federal securities laws. Uh, what they did in the Binance and Coinbase cases that I think uh, go, goes further is to say, uh, not just that the digital assets are securities, but that uh, Binance and, and Coinbase uh, are operating uh, as brokers uh, and as securities exchanges and as clearing facilities that need to be registered with the uh, SEC under the laws and regulations governing such facilities. So that's a step further, I think. Um, now, I think it was a natural step for the SEC to take because both Binance and Coinbase you know, adopt I'm sorry, operate highly integrated uh, trading platforms that, uh, in fact, appear to function as brokers, uh, as exchanges, and as clearing facilities. Uh, so that, in a sense, um, these two defendants, uh, Coinbase and Binance, were operating much more integrated uh, offering facilities, performing a multitude of functions uh, compared to some of the earlier cases that involved uh, issuers of um, digital coins, for example, where they weren't uh, uh, operating trading facilities for those coins after issuing them. Okay. And then um, there's this re very recent opinion from the Federal District Court, Southern District of New York, involving Ripple. And what kind of an impact do you think that might have on the Binance and Coinbase enforcement actions? Well, Ripple is certainly uh, only a, a half victory for the SEC and therefore uh, arguably a half victory for the crypto industry, although I think uh, uh, you know that's yet to be seen. What, what the district judge uh, said in, in Ripple, which is a Southern District of New York uh, decision, uh, is that the, the sales by Ripple of its XRP tokens uh, to institutional investors. These were direct sales uh, to institutional investors, uh, which appeared to uh, have been accompanied by various types of written documentation uh, and various types of representations, both oral and written. Uh, the, the, uh, the district court held that, that those sales did satisfy the Howey investment contract test because um, the purchasers, you know, put up their money, paid money to, to Ripple, that they uh, expected to profit uh, from their investments in the Ripple tokens uh, to gain some kind of return on that investment, and that the various representations and statements uh, made by Ripple before and during the sales led the institutional investors uh, reasonably to expect that Ripple would uh, exert efforts to, to improve the value of the Ripple token, to build the Ripple ecosystem, as it was called. Uh, and therefore, the uh, institutional investors were relying on a common enterprise to get their uh, uh, a common enterprise and the efforts of others, particularly Ripple, uh, to get the return they were looking for. Now, interestingly, the, 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 the district court then said, well, but it was very different with regard to sales that were made on other trading platforms, either by Ripple itself uh, or by Ripple's uh, two top executives. According to the district court, these were essentially faceless, anonymous transactions. Uh, the buyers did not know who the sellers were. The sellers did not know who the buyers were. And the uh, the court said, well, in, in those circumstances, the, the so-called, you could say, retail buyers, uh, th those who bought through uh, various types of trading platforms and, and what appear to be anonymous transactions, uh, they didn't know who they were dealing with. Therefore, they were not relying 
uh, upon a common enterprise or the expectation that that Ripple would be the one uh, improving their returns because they frankly didn't know uh, whom they were dealing with. I mean, that, that, that that's an interesting conclusion. I think, um, to my mind, that conclusion is not uh, particularly persuasive with regard to either Coinbase or Binance in terms of the transactions occurring on Coinbase's and Binance's trading platforms, uh, because in that case, the, the buyers would certainly expect, I think, reasonably that that Coinbase and Binance were, were in some sense, you know, the sponsors of and standing behind the trading platforms, and that the the fact that that Coinbase and Binance were offering trading platforms on which their tokens were being traded was part of an overall common enterprise meant to enhance the value of whatever tokens uh, they, they they were selling uh, on those trading platforms. So, you know, to the extent that the crypto industry uh, is saying that they won this great victory. Uh, again, my reading of the case is that the facts were, you know, relatively special in terms of the fact that the trading platforms here had, at least as far as I can see, in terms of the court's description, no connection to the issuer of of the token, and and no um, clear connection to the leading you know, executives or other players involved uh, with the issuer of the token. So uh, if I were Coinbase or Binance, uh, to me, I, I I wouldn't take too much comfort uh, from the Ripple decision. Now, clearly for for other issuers that don't operate a trading platform, um, you know, I think they can to some extent try to rely on on this decision and say, look, as, we, as long as we don't operate or uh, sponsor or in some way establish the trading platform, and, and these are transactions that are done anonymously, and the the buyers don't know that we, the issuer, are on the other side. You know, we can rely on this decision. But I think that's I think it's a very different case from my perspective uh, when you have an integrated operation like Binance or Coinbase, where you're both issuing these tokens, and you're operating and establishing and operating and sponsoring the the trading platforms on which these. Uh, you know these tokens are are traded now. One interesting po- point of the Ripple case, you know, that the, the uh, Howey test says that that the buyer of the security must expect that profits will come uh, essentially primarily from the efforts of, of either the seller or a third party. And one one issue that I think that was not developed that the SEC didn't pursue is Ripple was clearly putting out various types of public statements about you know what a great thing their token was and how they were building the Ripple ecosystem to make it more valuable and so on and why their blockchain was was so much better than either the Ethereum blockchain uh, or the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, you know, to, to the extent that, that uh, Ripple had understandings or agreements with these trading platforms saying, hey, look, you know, you provide the trading platform on which Ripple can be traded and we will give you, you know, various kinds of inducements or, you know, benefits for doing that. Uh, and to the extent that, that Ripple also may have said to their, you know, the potential universe of buyers, hey, look, you know, one reason that Ripple uh, is such a valuable token is that look at all the, the exchanges and, you know, platforms on which it's traded. To the extent there was some kind of, you know, agreement and concert or, or cooperative action between Ripple and the trading platforms, I think one could make the argument that, in fact, uh, the buyers who bought on, on the platforms were expecting to get, you know, uh, returns from a combination of actions from Ripple and these third parties who were trading platforms. Now, you know, based upon my reading of the decision, I, I haven't looked at the briefs. It doesn't look like the SEC tried to make that type of case that look, in a sense, Ripple and these trading platforms were, you know, operating in concert, you know, that there was a, there was a, you know, a grand scheme to, you know, enhance the value of Ripple by encouraging these platforms to trade Ripple and, and by making purchasers think that that was a good idea. Um, I think if, if you had that kind of a showing of a, of a common enterprise between the issuer of a token and the platforms on which it's traded, I think that that, that uh, the analysis could come out another way. Yeah. Did you ever consider the CFPB 
as uh, the appropriate regulator? Well, you you, you could imagine a, a situation in which you merge all three. I, I think there's always a balance between comprehensiveness and you know, sort of ability to manage and ability to handle a broad template of responsibility. So at what point does the agency become so overburdened with so many different things that it can't function effectively? Um, I, I don't think putting the CFTC and the and the SEC together would, would, would breach that because to me, uh, commodities uh, are investment products, it seems to me, much like securities, and I don't see why they're not regulated in an equivalent manner. Once you put all of consumer protection together with that, you know, it, 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 it gets more daunting in terms of the agency's ability to sort of do everything effectively. But I think it, I think it would be conceivable that one could do that. I would say that then there should be a sharp distinction between these products, which are not deposits, and stablecoin. Yeah, well, yeah, let's talk about stablecoins. You, in your article, uh, you view them differently, right? You don't view them as uh, security. And uh, uh, yeah, why don't you describe what you're advocating for stable coins? If stable coins simply say dollar in, dollar out, but no interest, um, then essentially it's hard to argue that there are securities under current law because there's not a return of profit to the investor. He just gets his money back. Now, an argument has been made and sort of suggested by Chairman Gensler that they're really like the uh, the, the poker chips you buy at the casino in order to gamble. And so they're the entry into the world of gambling on cryptocurrencies. So if, if they really do promise to give dollar in, dollar out, and they purport to have uh, reserves backing them up, they're really offering deposit treatment in the same way that I believe that money market funds with a fixed net asset value clearly offer deposit treatment. And to me, all such deposits should be inside FDIC insured banks. You know, there's there's a very interesting 1982 Supreme Court case called Weaver, uh, where, where the where the Supreme Court said that bank deposits are not securities. They said if they weren't inside FDIC insured banks, interest bearing deposits would certainly be securities under the test they later adopted in the Reeves case. Um, but they're not securities because we have a federal banking regulatory regime which is a satisfactory and indeed preferable alternative. And the FDIC insurance provides additional protection. So there's no need for SEC regulation of bank deposits. Of course, that means that if stable coins actually paid interest and were outside the banking system, they certainly would be securities subject to SEC regulation. But my view is all deposits, and for me that would include both stable coins and money market funds, should be brought inside the regulated banking system and be required to be FDIC insured. Uh, and I think that the, the recent crisis we've had with Silvergate, uh, Signature, SVB, and then First Republic indicates why that needs to happen. So let's take the Wyoming example. You could have a Wyoming crypto bank that's that's not FDIC insured. And what happens if people lose their confidence in whatever stable coins that Wyoming bank is issuing. There, there, there would be a run. And assuming that the Treasury or the, F, the Fed didn't step in in some way, there would be a tremendous loss to the depositors. And we saw exactly that happen with the collapse of state-sponsored deposit insurance systems, particularly in Ohio, Maryland, and Rhode Island during the 1980s and early 1990s, where you know the, the, the federal government gave limited help, but essentially all systems collapsed. And People lost a lot of money because, of course, unlike the federal government, the state governments can't print money. They've got balanced budget requirements. They can't print money. So if if whatever reserves they have are inadequate, there's no place to go. Uh, obviously, with, with the federal banking system, uh, the Fed can print money. Uh, the Treasury can issue guarantees. Uh, the FDIC has a $100 billion line of credit with the Treasury and it more or less explicitly has the full faith and credit of the U.S. government behind it. So the federal government can, in different ways, promise that bank depositors you know, won't lose their money. Now, there's a whole different issue as to whether we should go explicitly to a, you know, a 100 percent deposit insurance coverage. Uh, I don't think we need to resolve that issue to say it's clear that 
if we're talking about deposits, and again, I'm I'm referring to both stable coins and money market funds. They're much more secure, much better regulated inside the banking system. The FDIC sits there. It can assess deposit insurance premiums and build up the fund, um, which, of course, it cannot do for money market funds. It cannot do for stable coins. If a crisis occurs, similar to SVB or First Republic or Signature, and it's a potentially systemic crisis, uh, the Fed can step in with discount window loans, uh, possibly emergency lending programs, as they did uh, with the bank term lending uh, uh, program under 13.3 of the Federal Reserve Act, or the Treasury can step in, uh, as they did with their guarantee from the Exchange Stabilization Fund. So we have we have well-established mechanisms to ensure the stability of funds within the banking system, which we do not have outside. Everything outside is ad hoc. But the more we stretch outside the banking system, as we did in 2008 and 2020, to prop up things that are not banking funds, uh, we do two bad things. One is we arbitrage the banking system and undermine the effectiveness of banking regulation and monetary policy generally. We bankify then the financial markets and other things outside the banking system so that people get the protection without paying the price of regulation and paying the price of contributing to the deposit and insurance fund. And so we distort all sorts of market discipline signals within the, the broader financial markets. And we make those financial markets not behave like financial markets, but behave like subsidized, you know, uh, government protected uh, investments. So you, you then create an asymmetric risk curve where investors feel, hey, you know, shoot the moon because there's no limit on the upside, but now you've got a floor underneath you. So there's a there's a, a floor on the downside. So why wouldn't investors take ridiculous risks thinking that the government has the downside? We have to move completely away from this system we've been living in, uh, in my view, since the 1990s. Let's understand what banking is and banking should be. Let's have that be you know, well-protected, well-regulated uh and, and stable, and then let's have financial markets outside that are not subsidized by the government. Right. Would the um, you have to amend the Federal Deposit Insurance Act uh, in order to uh, deal with the uh, stable coin uh, being accepted as deposits? There, there is a Section 21 of the Glass Steagall Act, which is part of the Federal Reserve Act, 12 U.S.C. 378, which which essentially says that that non-banks cannot issue deposits. It's a criminal statute. The government was asked to invoke that in 1979 in in response to to, uh, Merrill Lynch's cash management account, which was a money market account with cash check writing privileges. And the the DOJ refused on grounds that were certainly not uh, adequate or satisfactory. Um, They they avoided all the, the functional similarities between money market accounts and deposits. At the time they passed it uh, in 1933, as part of the Glass-Steagall Act, uh, Congress was not confident that they could force all deposit-taking banks to be federally regulated as FDIC-insured banks. So it, it allows for state regulation of banks that could ex- accept deposits, even if they're not federally insured, which is exactly the loophole that Wyoming has exploited with its so-called speedy charter. So yes, you would have to 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 amend the the Federal Deposit Insurance Act to say only FDIC insured banks can can accept deposits by requiring all stablecoin issuers and indeed money market fund issuers to be FDIC insured banks. You would bring them into the Bank Holding Company Act because all FDIC insured banks are banks for purposes of the Bank Holding Company Act, which means that uh, their parent companies would be subject to consolidated Fed supervision and regulation under the Bank Holding Company Act. And uh, more importantly, or I say equally importantly, uh, commercial companies like big tech firms you know, couldn't own such banks. Uh, I'm very concerned that Apple particularly uh, and the other big tech firms are very anxious to use stable coins to get into the banking business without you know, being regulated as banks. 
We know that Facebook tried to do that with its Libra DM project, uh, which it ab abandoned, but a stable coin would be the natural next step for Apple to take to become a payments provider and, a and essentially a deposit provider. And if we don't want big tech firms dominating our banking system uh, and being subsidized as banks, we, we have to stop this from occurring. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, our, we have covered a lot of territory uh, today. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm wondering, uh, Congress right now, they're not considering doing anything right now, right? I hope they're not, other than uh, dealing with monetary uh, issues. The House Financial Service Committee, uh, there's a Republican draft and a Democratic draft of stablecoin bills bouncing around. And both drafts, uh, to me, uh, raise concerns, particularly the Republican one. Uh, unfortunately, neither bill says what I have recommended, that, that all stablecoin issuers must be FDIC-insured banks. It may be difficult with a divided Congress for any bill to emerge. Uh, I don't discount completely the ability of some combination of the crypto industry and the big tech industry to push something that would validate uh, these stable coins. But I, I certainly hope that will not occur. Yeah. Well, I hope uh, uh, if they hold a hearing on it, uh, you're invited to testify. You certainly should be with the, the amount of thought and care that you've given to this and uh, your experience as essentially a, uh, a bank regulatory lawyer uh, uh, and, uh, you know, teaching uh, uh, in this area for so long. So thank you very much, uh, Art, for being our guest today. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, we'll have to uh, monitor developments and as things uh, begin to crystallize at some point, probably not this year, but maybe next year, uh, we'll want to have you back on the show uh, to, to get your thoughts on, you know, what Congress is, is actually going to do. So th thank you again. Well, thank you, Alan. I, I appreciate it very much and, and would be uh, very delighted to have further conversations uh, as that seems warranted. Okay. And to make sure you don't miss any of our future episodes, please subscribe to our show on your favorite podcast platform, be it Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to check out our blog, also called Consumer Finance Monitor, uh, for daily insights on the consumer finance industry. And if you have any questions or suggestions for the show, please email us at podcast, that's singular, at ballardspar.com. Please stay tuned each Thursday for a new episode of our show. Thank you all for listening today and enjoy the rest of your day.